what do you think about the latest reported evidence indicating possible bacterial life on Mars? In particular, they've ruled out meteorites as the source of the amount of methane they're detecting in the atmosphere, and also a reinterpretation of the Antarctic meteorites suggested that the small fossil-like structures were similar to uh, magnetically sensitive bacteria on Earth? Yeah. Well, I, I think many of you are familiar with the story of life on Mars having several lines of evidence suggesting life on Mars. Of course, the big science news story of 1996 in August was the Martian meteorite ALH 84001, and uh, some NASA scientists at Huntsville and also uh, Richard Zare here at uh, Stanford University opened that thing up, and they claimed that they have seen evidence inside that indicates that uh, there were microbial Martians at least four billion years ago. Now, that's very contentious, and it has been ever since the announcement, and I think it's still contentious. It, it, a lot of it hangs on the interpretation of these, uh, these magnetic materials in there, which look, which look like the kind of magnetic materials that bacteria make on Earth. But I'm not the one to ask about that. Actually, at the SETI Institute, we have on the order of 60 scientists, 50, 60 scientists, and uh, almost all of them are astrobiologists. SETI is a small part of that. Okay. And uh, the single subject that is most studied at our institute is Mars. So I recommend you get in touch with some of those guys and ask them their opinion. But at this point, I think they would all agree that while there are many suggestive things, like the methane on Mars is very suggestive, right, uh, that it's not at the point where you say, you know, we know there was life on Mars or that there is life on Mars. It's still indicative and not definitive. I think that that's fair to say. Yes, sir. I read something a while back that was thought-provoking, and I'd like your thoughts on it. The uh, possibility of detecting signals depends not only on how many intelligent civilizations exist, but on uh, how, long it, uh, how long their technological capability persisted. And since the age of the universe is, what, roughly 13, 11 billion years or something like that? Yeah, 13 billion. 15 billion. Big number. Uh, if there's only 10,000 of our order magnitude the, uh, intelligent civilizations to look for, the probability that they all exist at the same time as us seems pretty remote. So how do you factor in the uh, simultaneity of our technological capability to listen and the capability of someone else sending to, to uh, be existing at the same time? Yeah, uh, the gentleman's question has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, why do you think that they're out there broadcasting now? Uh, you know, the universe is very old and maybe they, you know, the, those radio waves that would indicate ETs out there have washed over this planet, you know, 300 million years ago and the bivalves didn't find them. Or maybe they're going to come in another 300 million years. But all of that is encompassed in the Drake equation, right? Because that last term in the Drake equation, L, how long a civilization lasts, actually deals with it. And this, this is the way to look at it. Suppose I ask you, how many students are at Foothill College, for example? Or at Stanford. I'm going to make it easier because it's a four-year school. How many students are enrolled at Stanford? Well, you could figure that out. You can make a pretty good estimate by saying, look, how many freshmen are admitted every year? Take that number and multiply it by the average number of years they stay there, which is four, right? So that gives you the number of students at Stanford fairly accurately. Well, what Drake was saying, and this is, this is the right way to look at it, it seems, how many societies are born every year in the galaxy, right? Intelligent societies, societies that are technological, how many come online, if you will, every year? And then that number might be less than one, but it's some number. And then how long do they stay in that transmitting state? So it's completely analogous to the Stanford example there. And that gives you the number that are broadcasting signals that are going right through your bodies as you suffer through this presentation. And that's the number that was estimated at being millions by Carl Sagan or 10,000 by Frank Drake. It's the number that are contempor contemporaneous with us that are out there now, if you will, broadcasting now. And they're, you know, they're time of flight issues here, but they're not important. Okay, got that? Let's take two more questions because I know looking stultified. Yes. All right. Uh, assuming that we do find an extraterrestrial intelligent life um, and paranoia aside, what rational planning have we done to prepare for this uh, mathematically uh, probable yeah. You're asking, what planning have we done to prepare the world for this news? More like, what, do we, what are we going to say to them? Oh, what are we going to say to them? Oh, that's, yeah. Okay, that's a different thing. Uh, or, well, you can answer the other one, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to answer both. Okay, uh, as far as preparing for how we deal with the news, there is, in fact, there's not a whole lot of preparation. 
Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that Spain did a whole lot of preparation for the eventuality that, you know, Chris Columbus might trip across a new continent. But we, we've done more than that, and there is actually a document. It, it's called a protocol, which I think is a very unfortunate name. And, in fact, a committee that I chair uh, at the International Academy of Astronautics is, has recently revised that document. It's very simple. We've simplified it and re re removed uh, some incongruities in it. All it does is say, look, if you find a signal, you verify it, and then you announce it to the world, right? The first thing you do is you tell all the, all the astronomers in the world because you want them all to train some instrument, whatever instrument they have, in the direction of this thing. And, and you know, then you tell the press and the government. In fact, we've already seen that what happens is that the first people to know are the press, right? Because there's no, there's no secrecy in SETI. There's no policy of secrecy. A lot of people like to think that there is, but, but there's not. There really is not. As soon as we get a signal that looks interesting, everybody's emailing their, you know, girlfriend, you know, well, Madge, don't tell anybody, but we got this thing. You know, <laughs> Madge's brother puts it on his blog, you know, five minutes later. I mean, in, in a sense, it's, it's not such a good strategy because that means there are going to be a lot of false alarms and you, you can worry about credibility. But, in fact, there is no secrecy. So that's what it says. And then it says one more thing, and that is no response to a detected signal will be made without international consultation. Now, that originally arose during the uh, time when the Soviet Union was still in existence and also doing SETI. And, you know, there was some level of distrust that if the Soviets found the signal, they might monopolize it, not tell us, and broadcast back signals and, you know, get them on their side kind of thing, you know. <laughs> make a lot of sense to me, but yeah. All right, or that we might do it from the Soviets' point of view. So in order to forestall this, we all agreed, look, if you find a signal, you tell everybody, and you don't start trying to get in touch without international consultation. And it was never specified what international consultation was, right? Did you tell the Swedish checkers team? Was that international consultation? Right? Was it the UN? You know, that kind of thing. Nobody knows. So, uh, but on the other hand, it was kind of a guarantee that you, nobody would rush to the transmitters and start broadcasting their personal philosophies to the aliens. Now, there are people who think broadcasting anything would be dangerous. And in fact, there are people in the world who wanted us as a SETI group to forbid anybody to transmit even ab initio. In other words, without finding a signal, to transmit to, you know, Betelgeuse or something, uh, your, your favorite, uh, you know, the, a song you composed last weekend because they might launch the rockets and you'll be responsible for the uh, destruction of the world. There are very serious people who, who think this is an issue. I don't think it's an issue, uh, I, not just because I'm sanguine that the aliens are not going to, you know, launch their missiles against Earth. They're very far away. Uh, but beyond that, and, and are they really that aggressive? But of course, who knows? But the, re the real point is this. If you're really worried about that, you better petition tomorrow to shut down the BBC, NBC, CBS, and all the radars down at the local airports. Because they are broadcasting, and they have been broadcasting for a long time. So that's what they'll get first. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, uh, I, I hope that answers your question. In terms of what it means, of course, to get a signal, that depends on whether we can ever figure out what it what the information content is. If you can, statistically, they're way ahead of us. Okay? They're not at our level. That would be highly improbable. That's like taking a wheel of fortune with maybe 10,000 slots on it. Right? They could be zero years ahead of us, one year, two years, all the way up to 10,000. For example, spin it once. What are the chances that they're fewer than 100 years ahead of us? You know, 1%. Right? So they're, they're, they're going to be way ahead of us. So if you can understand it, it might be very interesting. It might be very interesting indeed. I don't count on that, but... You know, I think the real thing you learn is that what has happened on this planet has happened on many other places in the universe. Okay, I see that that is it. I want to thank you very much. If you want to come see me, I'll be upstairs in the back. If you bought a book, I'll, I'll send it. Thank you.